and I thank you. Therefore, it is time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. I would like to ask her about Sudbury, but I don't need the Attorney General telling me that it is before the courts. We all know it's before the courts. We all know that liberal ethics and integrity is before the courts. We all know the The, uh, the Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation has continued while I stood, and so now I'm going to give him a warning. The member is now warned. And the banter back and forth is not helpful. Please finish. We all know that alleged bribery is before the courts. We all know that liberal political corruption is before the courts. So I'm not going to ask about that because I want a real answer. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier support the member from Kitchener-Conestoga's Illegal Pill Press Act? Will the Premier help put a stop to the use of these machines by drug dealers across Ontario? Mr. Speaker. I know the Minister of Health is going to want to uh, speak to the details on this, but I want to, I want to just assure the House and the people of Ontario that the, uh, the opioid uh, crisis that has seized not just, uh, not just this province, Mr. Speaker, but jurisdictions all over the world is something that we are taking very, very seriously. We are fighting. We have put um, literally hundreds of millions of dollars into the front line, into services and supports for uh, the people who are uh, on that front line and who are dealing with, uh, with this very, very serious situation. I've had an opportunity to sit down with uh, a number of people who are frontline workers. I sat down last week with the Minister of, uh, of Health and the uh, Chief Medical Officer of Health and the Chief Coroner, Mr. Speaker, to, uh, to get their best advice both from the frontline workers and those officials, on what more we could do, Mr. Speaker, to fight this uh, public health crisis. Thank you. <coughs> Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, my question is again for the Premier. While the Premier spends her time testifying tomorrow during the Sudbury bribery trial, the Ontario PC party, party is going to continue to fight for better mental health and addiction here, services. Here, here, here. Research provided by the Ontario Drug Policy Research Network showed that two Ontarians die every day from the opioid overdoses. I've always said there's no monopoly on a good idea, and the Premier has an opportunity here. There, there, is, there is a toolkit here for fighting this opioid crisis. Chief Government Whip, come to order. And it sounds to me like there's a few members that need to be told that they're moving to warnings. It stops. Carry on, please. Mr. Speaker, there are a number of ways we can combat this opioid crisis, and one of those tools in the toolkit is this Illegal Pill Press Act, the idea and the suggestion from the member from Kitchener-Conestoga. So rather than partisan responses, what I'd hope is the Premier would say, this is a good idea, we're going to look at it, we're going to embrace it, we're going to support the member from Kitchener-Conestoga. So can we count on the Premier to do that? Will you help those Thank families you. that are struggling with this opioid crisis? Mr. Speaker, uh, you know, uh, I work every day for the people of Ontario, and I will continue to do that, Mr. Speaker, this week and next week and the week after, Mr. Speaker. So let me just say, and I agree, I agree that there is no, uh, there's no patent on a, on a good idea, Mr. Speaker. It doesn't matter where it comes from, and uh, the Minister of Health in the final supplementary will speak to that. But let me just talk for one moment about the things that we are doing, because we do have a strategy, Mr. Speaker. We are working to fight the opioid strategy, and let me just talk about some of those things. We're providing an immediate $222 million boost over three years to enhance and prevent uh, opioid addiction and overdose. We're adding more frontline harm reduction workers you across the province, that. and I heard that from the frontline workers that they needed that, Mr. Speaker. They but need more uh, numbers in their ranks. We're expanding the Answer. supply of naloxone, Mr. Speaker, and, and doing that, that free of charge, and we're expanding rapid access addiction medicine clinics access to those across Ontario. Thank the you. Minister you of Health will speak to the, uh, the other issue. Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, I'm disappointed that I didn't get a uh, response on the legal pill press yeah. suggestion from the, miniature, from the MPP from Kitchener-Conestoga. 
Another way that we can help with this is, is understanding that there's a lack of education. There's a lack of awareness of just how lethal this is. Just two milligrams of fentanyl is a lethal dose. Pills are flooding our communities. And right now, the government has this massive advertising campaign. The government advertising budget is now $57 million, up $32 million. And instead of using this money for partisan vanity ads that the Auditor General has already criticized, can we not have a commitment from the government to use some of their advertising budget to actually fight the opioid crisis, to actually raise education and awareness on the opioid crisis? So I didn't get a response on the illegal pill press suggestion. This is another solution Question. in the toolkit. Directly to the Premier, can we count on her support for an advertising campaign instead of vanity ads, but to help fight this opioid crisis? Help in long -term care. You say it, please. Thank you. Premier. Long -term care. Speaker, of course, we are investing dollars and working with our stakeholders in developing a robust and appropriate and sensitive as well uh, and effective public education campaign. That's necessary. It's impossible to address this comprehensively unless we do that. So we're already doing that. When it comes to pill presses, the, the leader of the, of the official opposition should know, I mean, as he was a federal uh, member of parliament, that the federal government just passed C-37, which includes a provision that prohibits the unregistered importation of designated devices such as pill presses. And frankly, it's overly simplistic, and it fits with their law and order approach to this crisis, that they would focus on something as simplistic as pill presses. That's not going to solve this problem. You need a multifaceted approach like we do, investing almost $300 million over the next two and a half years. And I'm still waiting for any good idea Answer. that we can embrace that will prove effective. And I want to know what the, minute, what the member opposite thinks about safe injection sites as well. Do you support Thank them? You. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. New question? The Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. A few months ago, the government announced a $6.7 billion purchase of a foreign energy company. And as part of the deal, Ontario decided to get back in the coal business. So while the Premier is testifying in Sudbury's, the bribery scandal, Hydro One will go ahead with the purchase of the second largest coal plant west of the Mississippi. Wow. And despite what this government says, there really is only one pro-coal party in the legislature, that's right. and that's, that's your right. Ontario Liberal Party. You know, the Liberals, the Liberals, Mr. Speaker, now own one of the U.S.'s top 20 greenhouse gas-producing power plants. That goes against everything the Premier pretends to stand for. Question. So, Mr. Speaker, a very direct question to the Premier. When will the Liberals and Hydro One be shutting down their shiny new dirty coal Thank plant? You. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, you know, uh, Mr. Speaker, I recall um, as we shut down the last coal-fired uh, plant, Mr. Speaker, and uh, in the run-up to that, I remember. The member from Leeds Grenville will come to order. Carry on, please, Premier. You know, I remember, Mr. Speaker, because uh, you recognize, and I know the member opposite does, that uh, that the shutting down of the coal-fired plants in Ontario is the single largest initiative to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in North America. And I recall, Mr. Speaker, a certain prime minister, a previous prime minister, in whose government this member sat, Mr. Speaker, touting how well Canada was doing on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Mr. Speaker, the record of Canada rested entirely on the results that we had here in Ontario, shutting down coal and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Mr. Speaker. That is our record here in Ontario. You see it, please? You see it, please?
Supplementary. Mr. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, I did not get a response about this decision of Ontario to buy a coal plant. Not only did the Premier's new purchase come with a coal plant, now the deal comes with what Sierra Club called an 800-acre toxic soup waste site. Doug Howe, senior campaign organizer for Sierra, said, I quote, one thing you need to understand is that you're not just getting a coal plant, you're getting a toxic waste site and all the liabilities that go with it. Hal added that Avista might be on the hook for a $100 million cleanup. Where is that coming from? Well, thank you, Hydro One. Thank you, Premier. You're putting Ontario on the hook for this. So, Mr. Speaker, how much will Ontario uh, Hydro One ratepayers be paying for this coal plant's toxic waste Question. cleanup? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Please rise and answer that question, Mr. Minister. Because it just shows the lack of understanding on the energy system on that side of the House, Mr. Speaker, because Ontario ratepayers will pay zero, Mr. Speaker, just like their plan, Mr. Speaker. It's nothing. There is no plan coming from that side, Mr. Speaker. 194 days, 194 days, Mr. Speaker, since they talked about coming up with some idea on what to do with the energy sector, Mr. Speaker. What we've done, Mr. Speaker, we've reduced rates by 25 percent, making sure every family and household in this province actually sees that reduction. Again, Mr. Speaker, zero from that side of the House. Now, when it comes to Asta, Avista, Mr. Speaker, they're a progressive utility by most standards. Ahead of the curve on technologies like net metering, EVs, yes, and biomass, and this just goes to show, Mr. Speaker, how far ahead of the curve we are when it comes Thank to you. eliminating coal, Mr. Thank you. Final supplementary. Wow. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, and I get that their talking points are the, on this are attack the opposition, attack others. The reality is they bought a dirty coal plant. The Ontario Liberal government, Order. that intended to be against dirty coal, is now in the business of buying coal. Now, maybe it's the Liberal members have lost their values. Maybe they no longer oppose uh, coal. But it appears like one Liberal may have a different approach. Liberal MPP Glenn Murray, former MPP Glenn Murray, and I wish him all the best on his new career. And I want to ask this direct question to the Premier. Did the former Minister of the Environment resign his seat from Cabinet and his seat in the Legislature because he was so disappointed and he could not support the government's decision to get back in the business of dirty coal? Thank you. Order. <laughs> Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I know Glenn Murray is very proud to say that it was this government that shut down coal plants, like taking seven million cars off the road, Mr. Speaker. You know, Mr. Speaker, Glenn Murray can talk about actually our energy system being 92 percent GHG free, Mr. Speaker. That's something that this government has done against what they were saying, Mr. Speaker. Always the no party on that side. I know PC stands for pro-coal, Mr. Speaker, and also no. But, you know, let's talk about a few things that happened. While they're sitting on their hands, Mr. Speaker, plenty has happened in the world. You know, spring has turned and summer, and now summer's turning into fall. Our kids have finished one grade and they've started another, and our others have graduated high school and gone on to college and university and are getting free tuition, Mr. Speaker. And that's all again while they sit on their hands. It's 194 days. They have no idea what to do with energy. They have no idea what to do in this province. We'll continue to govern for this people in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. New question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, uh, my question is to the Premier. 
Yesterday, the Ontario Hospital Association called on the Premier to immediately commit to rapid and aggressive new investment in Ontario hospitals. The OHA confirmed, in fact, what I've been hearing all over this province for far too long. The Conservative and Liberal cuts to health care have caused a crisis for Ontario families. People are waiting hours in the ER. They're being forced to spend days on end, Speaker, on stretchers in hallways right here in Ontario's hospitals. When will this Premier stop the cuts and invest in the health care that Ontarians deserve? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, uh, I understand that the uh, OHA issued a news release today, Mr. Speaker, and they are uh, calling for more funding for Ontarians, uh, Ontario's hospitals. And, Mr. Speaker, we recognize that uh, there need to be needed to be more in, in uh, investment in hospitals, Mr. Speaker. And that's exactly why we've increased our investments in health, Mr. Speaker, and particularly in hospitals. And so, in our budget, Mr. Speaker, uh, there was a, a two percent minimum increase to each hospital across the province and overall a 3% investment, Mr. Speaker, uh, $500 million in Ontario's hospitals that we put in place, wow. Mr. Speaker. And that is, that is an increase, Mr. Speaker, but we have increased funding every single year, but we recognize that particularly for hospitals, there needed to be a particular increase, and that's why we put that funding in place, Mr. Speaker. Answer. We will continue to work with the OHA. We appreciate the work that they do, and as I said, we have recognized that there needed to be an increase to Ontario's hospitals. That's why it was in the budget. Supplementary. And that's why the Liberals didn't listen to the OHA and actually reduced the amount that they asked for by $300 million just in this budget, Speaker, in the 2017 budget. Perhaps they should rethink when they go to their budget process and actually listen to what those folks are saying. The last Conservative government, what did they do, Speaker? They closed 28 hospitals, fired 6,000 nurses, 7,000 hospital beds gone. When the Liberals came into power, instead of reversing the cuts, they froze health care spending for four years. For Five years after that, they actually stopped increasing uh, to, to, uh, inflation. They reduced the increases to below inflation. They continue to worsen the health care crisis across the province. Hospitals are overcrowded. Without a major change, we're going to be in big, big trouble. When is this government going to start implementing the change we need instead of following in the footsteps of the previous Conservative government? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, we are making multi-billion dollar investments in the hospital sector, and I'm proud to say that the OHA stands beside us. They're important stakeholders and partners, and we look to them for advice on an ongoing basis. And, Mr. Speaker, as the Premier uh, mentioned uh, a few moments ago, uh, in the last two years, more than a billion dollars into hospitals specifically. Over the next 10 years, Mr. Speaker, we're putting $20 billion into hospital infrastructure for uh, new beds, for for expansions, for redevelopments, for brand new hospitals. There are 34 projects either underway right now or in the planning stage across the province. You voted against a 3.1 percent funding increase, and these are all matters that, of course, the third party in the last budget voted against, Mr. Against. Mr. Speaker. Voted against. So we will continue, as we have every single year, make important investments, and we're working with our partners, including the UHA, to do that effectively. Final supplementary. Speaker, Ontarians, Ontario families know that our health care system is not working. Nurses and frontline health care workers know that our health hospital and health care systems are not working. They know that long-term care is not working. Doctors know that our health care system isn't working. And now hospital administrators are telling the Premier that the health care system in Ontario isn't working. The Premier and the Minister of Health are the only two people, or seem to be the only two people in Ontario, who don't recognize that the health care system isn't working. Is this Premier really that out of touch, Speaker? Or is it just not a priority for her Liberal government? Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the leader of the third party is correct when she 
referenced the fact that the PCs, when they were in government, closed approximately 10,000 hospital beds. Uh, and they're correct when they said that the, that the PCs yesterday, I believe, that they fired more than 7,000 nurses when they were in power. But, Mr. Speaker, it's important to recognize in the five short years when the NDP were in power, they not only closed 24 percent of the acute care beds in this hospital, close to the PC record, Mr. Speaker, 9,645 beds, hospital beds, were closed by the NDP in five short years. They closed unbelievably 13 percent of the mental health beds in this province as well. And in their last budget, before they were defeated, they actually decreased the hospital funding by 1 percent. So we're not going to take lessons. Answer. We're going to make the investments that our stakeholders ask us to make, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. My next question is also for the Premier Speaker. The Ontario Hospital Pro Association said that one of the causes of the uh, crisis in hospitals right now is that there's not enough care available for seniors outside of the hospital setting. CEO Anthony Dale has called on the Premier and her Liberal government to make investments this year just to stabilize the urgent situation in hospitals and also other care facilities like long-term care homes. What will the Premier be doing this year to make sure our parents and our grandparents have access to a safe place to live when they get and wh where they get the care that they need as they age? Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I, I appreciate the question from the leader of the third party because uh, I think she has hit on and certainly uh, has recognized, as we do, that this is a complex situation, that there is a continuum of care that is needed, Mr. Speaker, a continuum of care that won't be solved by just one initiative. And so that means that there are people in acute care beds in our hospitals who do need to be somewhere else. And I had the opportunity to meet with, uh, with health care advisors and with the Minister of Health last week, Mr. Speaker, and we talked about just that. How do we make sure that in every community across this province, where there are people who are in an acute care bed in a hospital, that there is either the support for them to go home or there is a bed in a, a long-term care home, or, Mr. Speaker, that we find ways to work, Answer. for example, with uh, other sectors, with the retirement home sector, Mr. Speaker, to find ways to find appropriate beds for these people. Uh, these. Thank you. Supplementary. Look, Speaker, the people of Ontario should be able to access the care that they need when they need it. 14 years of Liberal government, and they still can't access the kind of care that they need when they need it, Speaker. Our health care professionals should be given the resources that they need to provide the care to people in this province, the resources that they need to do their job, Speaker. Enough is enough. People all over Ontario are suffering at the hands of this Liberal government. The Premier has cut and frozen health care budgets for far too long, and she even refuses to do a broad inquiry into the dismal state of disrepair in our long long-term care system. How can this Premier ever even hope to fix our problems Speaker, in long-term care if she refuses to figure out what the problems are? Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm going to ask the Minister of Health to comment in the last supplementary, but, Mr. Speaker, we have never frozen or cut the health budget, yeah, Mr. No. Speaker, yeah, never. No. We have increased the health budget year after year after year, Mr. Speaker. And I would just say to the leader of the third party, I recognize and we recognize that this is a complex issue. We recognize that as the demographics shift and as our parents and our grandparents age, Mr. Speaker, and as we age, those of us who are baby boomers, Mr. Speaker, we recognize that there is going to need to be a continuum of solutions. This is not an a simple fix, Mr. Speaker. There isn't a single thing that we can do. You know, Mr. Speaker, my mom is going to be 89 in a couple of weeks, and my dad is 91. And I can tell the leader of the third party that it's not a simple Answer. thing to be with people as they age and to help them find the right place to be. And, Mr. Speaker, that story is being played out across this province. Final supplementary. Obviously, this Liberal government is not up to solving complex issues when they increase a health care budget and they still can't solve the problems in our health care system. Shame on them. 
This Premier should not be proud of this record, Speaker. The care homes and our, that our parents and our grandparents live in are understaffed. That's no secret. Perhaps she hasn't been in one, but they are understaffed, and the frontline workers are forced to do too much with too little. Our hospital association is warning that a crisis is coming, a serious crisis is coming, if something immediately isn't done about the Liberal cuts. Why is this Premier so out of touch that she doesn't see that health care is a priority for the people of Ontario, even if it isn't a priority for this Liberal Long term care. Minister of Health, long term care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I have to say that I do appreciate the fact that the leader of the third party finally actually did acknowledge that our health care budget increased this year, just like it has every single year since 2003. It has never been frozen. It has never been cut. It has increased year after year after year, Mr. Speaker. Order. And Mr. Speaker, that includes— Leader of the third party, come to order. Finish, please. And Mr. Speaker, that includes our funding. Over the next three years, we are— investing an additional $11 billion into our health care system, Mr. Speaker, and that includes in this year's budget important investments that will result in individuals being able to see shorter wait times, more long-term care, better staffing, uh, alternatives to long-term care. We're investing $100 million into a dementia strategy. So we're making the investments not where the third party necessarily wants them, but where our stakeholders and patients and Ontarians need to see Thank you. New questions, member from Kitchener, Conestoga. Thanks, uh, Speaker. My question is to the uh, Premier. A year after I tabled the Ontario Service Dog Act, those with disabilities requiring service dogs still await the legislated accommodations they should already be guaranteed. And so while the Premier makes her Sudbury bribery trial debut tomorrow, we will be continuing to fight for the rights of children with autism here at Queen's Park. We will continue to fight for the accommodations that have been denied to a nine-year-old Kitchener boy with autism, Kenner Fee. Accommodations that should be guaranteed and yet denied yep. by the Waterloo Catholic School Board and now the Human Rights Tribunal. Will the Premier join our fight for this vital access and step in to ensure Kenner and other children with autism don't have their required service dogs taken away from them when they get to school? Good question. Minister responsible for accessibility. Minister. Thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the member for this important question. Um, of course, our government is very committed to continue to break down the barriers faced by people with disabilities and those needing supports and accommodations, whether uh, they're students, adults, people at work. Uh, the laws pertaining to service animals are very clear, Speaker, and accessibility means giving people of all abilities that right to participate in everyday life. So we, we have standards in place. Um, and organizations must allow uh, a person with disability to be accompanied by a guide dog or other service animal in public areas. The standards, the accessibility standards, do not define what type of animal is considered. And we know that guide dogs um, are also covered as part of the Blind Persons' Rights Act. So we have standards in place around Answer. service animals. We have laws there, and I know the Minister of Education will uh, follow up in the supplementary in terms of uh, Thank you. the issue in the school board in question. Thank you. Supplementary? Uh, perhaps so, because we all know, and in this particular case, schools are not public facilities and therefore are denied. So. Um, AODA regulations already mandate service dog accommodations, as the minister mentioned, and the Ontario Human Rights Code speaks to the duty to accommodate persons with disabilities. Doctors, teachers, and international training schools have all testified of the importance of nine-year-old Kenner's service dog, Ivy. Yes, yet Kenner is still denied a service dog at school. What's worse, Kenner's one of many with autism, PTSD, hearing, or other disabilities requiring service dogs being denied access. So while Ontarians raise their voices with my petition to open access to registered service dogs and owners, I'm asking the Premier to save us the signing, sending and tabling of that petition. 
If she believes in accommodations for service dog users, she could step in today. Question. Will she do it? Will the Premier step in and ensure the public accommodations Kenner and so many requiring service dogs should be already guaranteed? Thank you. Good. Minister. Oh. Sir. Minister. Sorry, yes, sorry. My apologies. Minister of Education. Thank you, Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. And Speaker, I know that this has been a challenging situation for Kenner and his family. And uh, while the Ontario Human Rights Commission has ruled in favour of uh, the board in this instance, Mr. Speaker, we expect school boards to consider the needs of students and uh, and to put those needs first and foremost in every decision that they make. And and that includes. Um, appropriate accommodations and supports for students in our school so that they can uh, ca they can be successful mr. speaker and that is why uh, we are working to in to put together um, ad accessibility standards for education and that's something that we're in the process the member from of from developing, mr. Order. speaker um, because we want, yes, uh, we want to have programs and supports in place, whether that means individual accommodations, um, having extra time, physical alterations to the classroom, and that. Thank you. New question, the member from Kitchener Waterloo. Yes, Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Premier, the people of this province deserve a government that respects the democratic process. But at the Sudbury trial yesterday, we learned that your party only abides by the democratic process when it benefits them. Instead of having a democratic nomination race like the local riding association wanted, there was confusion about who would become the candidate. First, there were rumours that Mr. Olivier would be appointed, then the Minister of Energy was appointed. Was Stop the clock. Come to order. Minister of Finance, come to order. Start the clock. Finish, please. I realize that the government does not want to hear this question, but the people of this province knows that the Premier is going to court to more— Drop the clock. <laughs> Best comment I've heard. We will. Try again, please. Thank you. Was the Premier aware that the Sudbury Riding Association had requested a, de a Democratic nomination meeting and not an appointment from her office? It's a simple question. Attorney General. Well, thank you very much, Speaker. And, um, I will remind the members again, as I did yesterday, that uh, 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 this line of questioning is inappropriate. This matter is before the courts, and the member opposite knows that. Member from Hamilton Mountain, come to order. Finish, please. Thank you, Speaker. As I was saying, this matter is before the courts, and it will be highly inappropriate to answer any questions in relation uh, to the proceedings that are ongoing. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Very much. Again to the Premier. In exchange for becoming the Liberal candidate in Sudbury, two of the Minister of Energy's former staffers. Uh, receive paid positions from the Liberal Party. These paid positions Mr. are well Second documented time. in emails. Clearly, there was a lot of pressure to appease not only the Minister of Energy, but also the Riding Association and Mr. Olivier. In fact, Mr. Berra is on the record with Mr. Olivier, and I quote, of course, you recognize the position that we're going to find ourselves in here, where she's going to have to make a decision around the appointment versus allowing this to go ahead to the Premier. Is that why you agreed to the Minister of Energy's demands? 
Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. Well, spe Speaker, the, the opposition is fully entitled to waste their, uh, their time by asking questions that they know is uh, inappropriate to ask in this House because they relate to a legal proceeding. Uh, on this side of the House, Speaker, this Premier and this government will continue to focus on issues uh, that will result in building a, a fairer Ontario, like raising the minimum wage, uh, 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 Speaker, to $15 an hour so that we have fairer workplaces, like making sure that one-third of all full-time students in our province uh, are attending college and university for free, like what we have seen, Speaker, that there are they're more new, uh, uh, new students are able to go to college and university because in the past they were not able to do so. So because of the policy changes that we have brought forward uh, uh, in, in making sure that uh, families from low-income families, uh, kids from low-income families are Answer. able to attend college and university. These are the kind of things people, uh, Speaker, the people from Sudbury and all across Ontario are working from, and that's what they expect Thank of their you. government. The member from Davenport. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question this morning is to the Minister of Housing and Minister responsible for the Poverty Reduction Strategy. And let me just start by congratulating him on his appointment to Cabinet. Yeah. Speaker, this summer I had the opportunity to talk to my constituents in Davenport about how our government is helping people get ahead in an ever-changing economy. From the many changes to OSAP and providing free tuition for many families across Ontario to providing um, to OHIP Plus, to, which, which will be providing over 4,400 prescription medications for free to those under 25. I've also talked a lot about rent control, and I heard from families in Davenport that they feel there is a greater sense of stability and fairness in the rental market. Some advocates would like to see the removal of vacancy to control, Question. which means when a unit becomes empty, a landlord can increase the rent by whatever they want. Speaker, through you, can the minister explain why the government has not removed vacancy to control? Thank you, Minister Responsible for Poverty Reduction Strategy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Davenport for the important question. Yeah. Our policies like rent control are designed to create greater fairness and opportunity for the people of Ontario. Yeah. Thanks to our fair housing plan, all renters, and I repeat, all renters in Ontario now know their rent is not going to increase beyond 2.5%. Yeah. At right. the same time, our government understands that if more landlords are uh, participating in the rental housing market, there will be more affordable choices available for tenants. And through our plan, landlords will continue to have the predictability and flexibility to negotiating start, uh, starting rents based on current market values uh, with new tenants as well as with vacant units. So, Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue to implement our plan, working hard yes, to ensure that the rental system is fair for all Ontarians. Thank you, Speaker, and I'm glad the riding. Uh, I'm glad the government has listened to the concerns of the people in my riding of Davenport and enacted the Fair Housing Plan to protect renters from across the province from sudden dramatic, dramatic rent increases. Again, to the Minister of Housing and the Minister responsible for the poverty reduction strategy. Rental and housing prices are rising in centres of prosperity around the world, including the Greater Horseshoe Area. One of the primary reasons is because people want to live in great communities like Davenport and Etobicoke Lakeshore. With more than 80,000 people coming to Ontario each year, it's important that we are able to keep up with the growing demand for housing. People in my riding of Davenport want to make sure that we maintain a healthy supply of housing for the people in Ontario. What is this government doing to ensure that Ontario maintains a healthy supply of housing? Thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Our government, under the leadership of Premier Wynne, is committed to making it easier for the people of Ontario to buy or rent a home. Our plan. Uh, is to increase supply and rein in speculation. It's about creating stability in the market and addressing affordability. It's exactly for that reason that our Fair Housing Plan contains a $125 million program to help stimulate more uh, rental housing. Wow. It's why we're freeing up provincial lands to develop up to 2,000 new units of housing. Wow. It's why we've created a dedicated housing development group to improve planning timelines and cut red tape and get shovels in the ground. And it's why we're working with our municipal partners to get secondary suites 
on the market as quickly as possible. Mr. Speaker, our government, yes, unlike the Conservatives, supports housing in, this Ontar right. in Ontario, right. supports social housing, affordable housing, and market housing, and will work to. Thank you. Stop, stop. You see it, please? You see it, please? New question, member from Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Education Minister. Speaker, while the Premier testifies tomorrow on the Sudbury bribery trial, the Ontario PC Party is fighting for childcare spaces for children, especially in rural Ontario. Parents whose children were in before and after school and childcare spaces in schools you closed are scrambling to find another yeah. option. I want to know how many childcare spaces could have stayed open if you hadn't shut down all those schools across Ontario. Here, here. Minister of Education. Uh, Minister um, of, of women's, women's Issues and Responsible for Child Care. <laughs> Minister Responsible for Child Care and uh, Early Early years. Years. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm proud to rise today and talk about some of the great work that we're doing when it comes to transforming the way we deliver child care in this province. Let's not forget that we are making historic historic investments in childcare and we are uh, pledging to move forward with 100,000 new childcare spaces but mr speaker i'd like to thank the member opposite for the question because the early years are important and we want to give children the best start in life and so by doing that our number one priority is to make sure that we are delivering programs that are safe and in good in good situations for our children and so what we are doing yes, is asking our schools to be able to provide parents where desired uh, before and after school care on demand in the numbers that they require. Thank you. Supplementary. You're right. It is historic and it's transforming when you close 700 schools across Whoa. this great Whoa. province. Whoa. I'm not certain how it can't be safe when there's no places for them to go to. In my writing alone, you still haven't announced if you'll reinstate closed schools, or what will happen with the licensed before and after school and childcare spaces at Paisley Central and Beavercrest schools. I want to know, Minister, how many daycare spaces did you close when you shut down 700 schools across Ontario, and how many millions of dollars did you waste shutting them down? Here, here, here. Mr. Speaker, we know that most families, for most families, the workday doesn't begin and end with the school bell, and that's why our government is committing to make sure school boards offer before and after school programming for six and 12-year-olds. It's a commitment we made to families in 2014, and starting in September of this year, we have been delivering. We've been delivering on that province across uh, on that uh, promise across the province. Let me just tell you some of the things that we are doing. We are increasing access for families and children by building on the success of full-day kindergarten. We have created flexibility in the system. We have revised our framework so that we, are, we can enhance and build on existing practices. And the bottom line is these families are benefiting from these changes. Families now across the province, I believe the last number was 83 percent of schools in the province yes, were sir. supplying before and after school care to those families when they needed it. Thank you. New question, the member from Welland. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, we're joined in the members' gallery today by the um, Ontario Network of Injured Workers and a number of injured workers in this province. <laughs> Speaker, for many years, the Ontario workers' compensation system has failed workers who find themselves injured on the job. As it stands today, if you're a worker in this province who gets hurt while at work, unable to continue doing that job and reliant on benefits from compensation to meet your needs or your family's needs, WSIP has a pop. I suspect it's the Minister of Labour, but uh, I need to hear it. The Premier. Suspect it's the Premier. WSIP relies on a policy called deeming. That is, pretending that a worker actually has a job that you don't actually have to cut your benefit payments. Mm -hmm. For a government that claims to be so in tune with fairness and so in tune with workers in this process, it has led uh, workers into deeper and deeper poverty. When will the government put an end to deeming fix and Thank failed WSIP policies? Minister of Labour. Minister of Labour. 
Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the honourable member for that question. Speaker, the number one priority of the Minister of Labour, the person that occupies that seat, and the Ministry of Labour as an organisation is to ensure that people that go to work in the morning come home safe and sound at the end of the day to their families. Speaker, Ontario remains one of the safest places in the world to work. Unfortunately, Speaker, we're not at zero yet. Accidents do happen. Fatalities do happen, Speaker. And when they happen, the injured workers de deserve the respect and the dignity of a good WSIB system that allows them either to return to work quickly or, if that isn't possible, Speaker, allows them to, uh, to live a, a life of respect and dignity with the earnings that should go along with that, Speaker. So we've done a number of things to change that over the past few years. The worker is right. I think if you go back in years, Answer. the system often didn't work. I hope to address some of the things we have done in the supplementary, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, back to the uh, Minister of Labour, then. Uh, we need to ensure that workers injured on the job receive the protections and the benefits they deserve. We have Z uh, Jenny Zhao with us here today. She spent every day for five years on a knitting machine in a factory here in Toronto. After five years, she was sent home with a long list of repetitive strain injuries, back, severe carpal tunnel. She had surgery, and she could not return to work, even though her injuries were confirmed by doctors. But WSIB was able to cut her benefits, deeming that she could be a Walmart greeter a phantom job that she could never get, nor did she ever have. Right. Jenny went into severe depression. She was unable to get treatment. She suffered from insomnia, and she had to sell her house. She now lives in a basement just to make ends meet, and she had to apply for CPP. Speaker, I ask this government again, when is the Premier going to fix our broken system of compensation and make sure that injured workers are given the benefits and the protections that they need? Thank you. Minister. Speaker, thank you again to the member for the supplementary. And as I said, a priority of this government is treating people that have been injured on the job with the dignity and the respect that they deserve, Speaker. And we're prepared to make those changes. When the case is made that something should be changed, Speaker, for example, we bought in full indexation for both partially fully disabled workers by this January. Full CPI coverage that injured workers deserve. New amendments we brought forward in this year's budget to the Workplace Safety Insurance Act to end benefit clawback, Speaker, due to the eligibility for old age security benefits for those injured. And, Speaker, you'd wonder what those two things had to do with each other, with each other Speaker. They're improvements to the Act, they're improvements to the way that things that have been done, they're improvements that have been made to the lot of injured workers in this province, Speaker, and they're both things that that party voted against, yes, Speaker. Sir. Now, they're standing in the House and telling us about improvements that could be made, Speaker. When the case Thank is you. made, and the case was made in 2007, the concept of the Speaker. please. New question. Member from Barrie. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. I know that one issue that many cyclists face is that they can't ride their bike all the way to work, despite how much they would like to. Hopping on their bike is an important part of their day, but for some, the distance just doesn't lend well to completing their trip this way. That's why I know a number of cyclists who want to bike for part of their trip and make transit or carpool to close the gap. But right now, many cyclists I talk to haven't, don't have this option because the infrastructure is securely, uh, to securely store their bike before heading to the next stretch of their trip just isn't there yet. This is a problem and, I, and one I think deserves action from our government if we're truly committed to promoting cycling in Ontario. Speaker, would the minister please inform the members of this House if Question. there are any plans to provide this much needing, needed cycling infrastructure? Thank you. Minister of Transportation. Well, uh, thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. Of course, I want to begin by thanking the member from Barrie for her question and for her ongoing staunch advocacy for her community and for cycling and transit and highway infrastructure investments right across the province of Ontario. Just this past spring, Speaker, our government announced a historic investment of $50 million to support commuter cycling infrastructure right across Ontario. Now, when we first announced this fund, Speaker, we launched the Ontario Municipal Commuter Cycling Program and promised more news on other programs that will be coming uh, with respect to this unprecedented investment. Well, Speaker, I'm so pleased to say that today I joined another colleague, the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport in Burlington, to provide that important update. This morning, Speaker, we announced that we are making it easier for cyclists to safely store their bikes 
with eight new bike lockers at each of our 15 commuter parking lots across the GTHA, yeah. including the lot of Highway yes, 400 and Essa Road up in Barrie. Speaker, this investment and more like it will help ensure that people finish the first and last mile of the trip by bike and, and encourage even more people to carpool. Thanks very much. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Minister. Speaker, people in my community of Barrie are constantly looking for new, active ways to get to work during the week and to get around the city with their families on the weekend. I'm so glad that the Minister recognizes this and is taking important strides towards building a more cycling-friendly province. In addition to the announcement this morning, we're, we're seeing important progress on a number of initiatives that enable and support cycling in Ontario, including the development of the Cycle On Action Plan 2.0, which will involve collaboration with stakeholders, the Ontario Cycling Tourism Plan, and the Ontario Municipal Commuter Cycling Program. The Minister of Transportation spoke about the carpool lots, including the lot That's in right. my community of Barrie, but I understand there was another important question answer or announcement this morning. Speaker, can the minister inform this House about the steps this government is taking to make cycling commuting easier for cyclists? Thank you. Minister, minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Thank you, Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Barrie for that question. This morning, I was pleased to, along with the Minister of Transportation, make a very important announcement at Appleby GO train station in my riding of Burlington about the future of cycling here in Ontario. Through the commuter bike program, our government is investing more than $2 million to create 28 bike rooms at 26 GO train stations in the GTA. Great. These bike rooms will be installed and will provide storage for more than 200 bikes, making life easier and more convenient for Ontarians by enhancing their transportation options. Speaker, we'll keep making these critical investments because our government knows that investing in cycling infrastructure connects our communities, promotes an active, healthy lifestyle, enhances quality of life, and simply because Speaker, it's the right thing to do. We know, too, that getting more people on bikes more often Answer. is a shared priority with our municipal partners. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Your question, the member from Huron Bruce. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. While the Premier spends her time testifying tomorrow during the Sudbury bribery trial, the Ontario PC Party is fighting for the health concerns of our constituents. It's not very helpful while I'm trying to get them to come to order. Finish, please. Speaker, over the summer, I continued to hear from constituents who told me stories about their health concerns from industrial wind turbines. These people included Norma Schmidt, Carlos Dracura, Joan Black, and Randy Glazier, whose wife, along with residents of their trailer park, have been negatively impacted by the turbines. All of them have told me over and over how they report issues to the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change, and then they do not see any action taken on their files. Clearly, the previous minister either failed in his attempt to try and make a difference, or he just gave up. Will the Premier commit to directing Question. the new minister to ensure that the ministry takes noise complaints seriously and finally finally starts taking measures to address the harmful effects. Thank you, Premier. Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Well, thank you uh, uh, to the member opposite for, uh, for that uh, important question, because uh, I know uh, issues around uh, wind turbine projects uh, uh, continue to pop up every now and then. And I can, I can say, uh, quite frankly, Speaker, that uh, our ministry takes concerns around uh, wind turbine construction very seriously, whether it be uh, noise complaints or whether it be uh, impacts, uh, potential impacts on water. We take that very seriously because the uh, the, the health of uh, Ontarians is uh, is paramount. Speaker, That's right. so you know we uh, we understand that uh, that various projects uh, have been appealed. Uh, we, we understand that uh, very pro various projects have been taken to the, uh, to the Environmental Review Tribunal. Consulting with the public is paramount. Answer. Consulting with the, the public is paramount, uh, and we make sure that, uh, that we consult, we make sure that we monitor, Mr. Speaker, and that we, we're sure that we stay on top of the Thank issues you. throughout. Supplementary. 
Speaker, actions speak louder than words. Speaker, the previous minister committed to coming down to Huron Bruce to visit with some of my constituents who have reported over and over again detailed problems while living close to industrial wind turbines. For goodness sakes, we will all remember the previous minister even agreed, and I quote, that no one should have to suffer noise or noise pollution from any source, and certainly not wind turbines in their community. Speaker, in August, I sent the current minister a letter inviting him to visit some of these sites while he's in my riding for the international plowing match. But, Speaker, I have yet to hear a response. Will the minister be permitted by the Premier to accept my invitation and visit with some of the Ontario residents who continue to raise significant concerns about industrial wind turbines? Minister. Well, thank you, Speaker. You know, Speaker, there has there has not been a single renewable energy project that the party opposite the PCs have ever supported here in this house. Not a single one, Speaker. You know, if, if, if it were up to them, Speaker, they'd put an end to all the efforts we're making to create a greener and more sustainable province. But you know what? Speaker, we remain committed to a cleaner future, and I can tell you, Speaker, that, that thanks to the clean air and clean energy, Ontario has saved more than $4 billion That's four billion in annual health and environmental costs. Wow. Unlike the PCs, we're not going to sit idly by, Speaker. Renewable energy projects, yes, they are necessary and a crucial part of our low-carbon switch. Off the clock. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. No question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The number of temp agency offices in Ontario has grown 20 percent. 20 percent in the last decade. Hundreds of thousands of people in this province now rely on these agencies for their paychecks. But the Premier's new Labour legislation doesn't go far enough to protect them on the job. Just last weekend, we were reminded in the media of the squalid and dangerous conditions that many of these workers face. Some, like 23-year-old uh, Amina Diaby, losing their lives because they had no other choice but to work in unsafe conditions. Will the Premier commit to doing the right thing by amending Bill 148 to better protect temporary agency workers? Speaker. Yeah, the leader of the third party for a very important question. And yes, we, we're, we're as concerned as you are when it comes to the growth in temporary help agencies in the province of Ontario. And let me say right from the start, Speaker, anybody that loses their life at work, anybody that's seriously injured at work, Speaker, our thoughts go out to them. It's something we try to prevent Absolutely. on a daily basis. The, the investigation on that, Speaker, obviously is, is still under review. Uh, charges, uh, I'm not sure if charges will be laid or not, or I'm not sure of that process, uh, is something we should be talking about, Speaker. But, but what we want to do is ensure that temporary help workers' rights are protected while they remain on the job. Exactly. What we've done, Speaker, through the Fair Workplace and the Better Jobs Act, Bill 148, is to ensure that these workers are paid the same as their full-time uh, counterparts when they're performing essentially the same work. They're given at least one week's notice when Answer. the assignment ends early, Speaker, and they have access to a more fair and transparent organization system, Very Speaker, should they, should they choose to organize, Speaker. I'll, uh, Thank you. I'll address others in the supplementary, Absolutely. Speaker. Supplementary. Speaker, today in Ontario, too many shady companies contract out risky work to temp agencies because our laws are written so that if a temporary employee is hurt on the job, Speaker, the company isn't held fully responsible. And yes, I call that shady. Yes. Our laws make it easy for unscrupulous employers, unscrupulous companies to save money by hiring temporary workers and allowing them to get hurt instead of investing in permanent employees and training them properly. Why is this Premier 
willing to let families who are already struggling just to get by risk their lives in dangerous workplaces in the province of Ontario? Okay. Many Many companies. Wow. Speaker, as I said earlier, we have Bill 148 before the House Speaker. We made the unusual move of bringing it or taking it out to the public after first reading, Speaker, Excellent. because we know that people have a lot to say on these issues. We know that it's something that we can, uh, that if we get the right input from those members of the public, uh, we companies. can do what needs to be done, Speaker. A lot of it is enforcement as well, Speaker. Yep. Employment standards officers, what we're proposing to do at the Ministry of Labour, Speaker, is hire up to 170 three more people to go Great out and proactively forward. inspect Great premises, perhaps like the one that was mentioned in the Star Speaker. We can get into 10 per cent of the workplaces in Ontario on an annual basis, Speaker, and that's something that we're unable to do right now with the hiring of those people. Great. There's a number of changes that will impact on temporary health agencies in the past. Speaker, they all come out of the yes, change of workplaces review, right. and I don't know, Speaker, the third party referred to that review as a waste of time. I don't oh, think anybody in this province believes that that was a waste of time, Speaker. And your question will move to be to see short. Well, thank you, Speaker, and my question is to the Attorney General. Now, Speaker, we are all very much aware of the large number of illegal store dispensaries that are selling cannabis, and they're popping up all over the province, and especially in the GTA. The police will shut them down, and sometimes the very next day they'll open up again, illegal dispensaries. So the federal government, as we know, has tasked the provinces to determine their own regulations and approach to retailing cannabis once it has become legalized. And I know that in my community of Beaches, East York, and others across the province, we all have questions and concerns about the impacts of this coming federal legislation into legalizing cannabis. So, Speaker. Can the Attorney General please clarify what the government is intending to do to shut down these dispensaries, to keep these dispensaries shut down so that they don't continually pop up? And will his speaker, will the, will the Attorney General explain to us the role that his ministry is playing in? Thank you, Attorney General. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and I uh, thank the member uh, for the important question. Speaker, Ontario is proposing a safe and sensible framework to regulate recreational cannabis within the province. Even as it becomes legalized, cannabis will remain a carefully controlled substance in Ontario, subject to strict rules when it comes to both lawful use and retail. Speaker, our aim from start has been to protect youth, promote public health and road safety, focus on prevention and harm reduction, and eliminate the illegal market. And Speaker, uh, so what we have proposed is a retail Member model that Chatham, takes a sensible Kansas. control approach of a new standalone cannabis stores and an online retail channel that will service the entire province. Wow. Uh, Speaker, we also are sending a very clear message to pot shops that have opened across our communities. They are operating illegally now, and they will be illegal under the new rules. They will be shut down. Speaker, Answer. we were heartened to uh, hear a statement from the Ontario Association of Chiefs of Police, which said that our preliminary review of the proposed legislation is that the government of Ontario has heard and responded positively to the voice of Ontario's police leaders. Seated. Supplementary. Well, thank you very much, Speaker, and I want to particularly thank the Attorney General for the incredible and the important work that he's doing on this file. It's a very onerous obligation that the federal government has passed down to provinces, and I believe the Attorney General in this government is taking excellent, excellent response in order to reflect the concerns of Ontarians. Now, Speaker, I know that the Attorney General's office has done extensive consultations over the summer, including an online survey that, to gauge the public's uh, interest in how we should best retail legalized cannabis. And I know that members of my community are pleased to hear of the safe and sensible approach the government is taking to how cannabis can be legally retailed in the province of Ontario, how they can purchase marijuana. Combating the illicit market, Speaker, is a key to keeping our cities and our most vulnerable as safe as possible. So, Speaker, on July 1, 2018, Question. we are hearing that there will be 40 new stores open for distribution, along with online delivery access, which is extremely important. So, will the minister explain how the government will decide on the new location? Attorney General. Thanks. Mr. Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd also like to thank the member from Beaches East York for the question. Mr. Nackby and I and our colleagues have been working diligently on this strategy. As you know, the federal government is set to legalize recreational cannabis next July, and we're working hard to be ready. We've consulted widely on retail strategy to ensure we get this right. 
And since our announcement, our safe and sensible approach to retailing distribution of cannabis has received support from Addictions and Mental Health Ontario, from MAD Canada, from the Cancer, Canadian Cancer Society, and labour groups. That's because the LCBO has a strong record of selling controlled substance in a socially responsible way, and their experience will be indispensable as we establish 150 standalone retail outlets by 2020, as well as online delivery. We have, been, we have ongoing discussions with the municipalities regarding the rollout of these retail stores. We'll continue to engage with municipalities yes, and other partners from across the province as we cite 150 standalone stores, and together we are going to do away with illicit activity and close it. Thank you. The member from Etobicoke Centre on a point of order. Better ideas, Chief. Speaker, I just wanted to uh, make everyone aware that the uh, Ukrainian Canadian Congress Ontario Provincial Council is hosting a Ukrainian Heritage Day flag raising today at noon at the courtesy flagpole, and all members are welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Minister of Labour on point of order. Correct my. Um, by record. Indeed, charges have been laid in the case that was referred to. The matter is before the court, Speaker. Mm. Question period being finished. Is, uh, this House stands recess until 3 p.m. this afternoon.